This lecture is the first lesson in Unit 4, and Unit 4 um, focuses on the supply curve and the building blocks of the supply curve, whereas uh, Unit 3 focused on the building blocks of the demand curve. Um, and Unit 4 is going to set us up for success in understanding the big concepts in Unit 5. So a lot of the things that we're going to be learning about in this unit are, um, are basics and may not make a lot of sense or um, be extremely interesting <laughs> on their own and in and of themselves. But when we put all the concepts together um, in Unit 5, it'll all make sense. Okay, so today we're going to look at short run production and um, the production function. And um, we're going to look for some patterns in in production and inputs and uh, levels of efficiency and how much output is added when uh, when workers are are added to the production process um, and things like that. So um, think about things from the point of view of a producer today. All right. So when we're analyzing production and costs and profits and and all the things that we're going to be getting into in this unit we can analyze them in the short run or in the long run and our analysis will be different depending on the time period that we're looking at. So in the short run, um, if we talk about analyzing things in the short run, the short run is a period of time long enough in which some inputs are fixed. So what that means is there are some things that can't be changed. Whereas in the long run, all inputs are variable. Um, basically everything can be changed in the long run if you plan for it. So fixed inputs, by definition, are things that can't be changed in the short run, whereas variable inputs um, can be changed in the short run. So we can't increase the amount of our fixed inputs in the short run, but we, we could in the long run, though, but not in the short run. Whereas variable inputs, um, we, can, we can vary the quantity that we're using in the short run. So to get you thinking about this topic, I would pose this question to you. Why can't adding more workers always increase output. This is a tough question to, uh, to ponder um, because some people believe that if you just keep adding inputs to production you should just keep getting more output. The reason why this doesn't work though is overcrowding sets in. Um, we have some inputs in the short run that are fixed as we just learned and those fixed inputs um, can only work to a certain capacity. So adding additional variable inputs to a certain amount of fixed inputs um, isn't always going to be helpful after a certain point. Um, I once heard <laughs> in, uh, in an AP lecture that I sat in on, um, a teacher was describing this question um, and asking, you know, why can't we feed the world from a flower pot. Why can't we grow enough crops to feed the whole world um, in a flower pot? You know, because one might think just put more seeds in there, put more fertilizer in there, water it more. Well, you still only have one flower pot, so you're not going to be able to generate enough food to feed the whole world from one flower pot. Um, so kind of think think of things in terms of, you know, some of our inputs are fixed, and so overcrowding, overcrowding uh, sets in. And so we can't just keep increasing output forever. Alright, so the example that I'm going to use as I go through uh, describing these terms to know and calculations to know and concepts to know is that of Subway and the Sandwich Artists. So, this data shows us um, some different amounts of workers, number of workers that could be working at Subway during a shift. So, we have 0 through 7 as possibilities there. And then the second column shows us total product, which is the amount of output a firm obtains in total from a given quantity of input. So depending on the number of workers working on the shift, here's how many sandwiches can be made during that shift altogether. So that's what total product is, is the total amount of output that um, can be produced given a, a certain quantity of inputs. All right, so the total product curve is going to have this sort of a shape. Um, you'll see that as workers are added to the shift, um, one worker, two workers, three, four, five, you know, as our number of workers increases, the amount of output that can be produced increases uh, to a certain point 
and this is kind of where that overcrowding sets in um, and then eventually it tops off and begins to decrease um, because we'll get to a point where adding more workers to a shift at Subway isn't going to do anybody any good. So think about um, your, your typical Subway experience. You walk in the door, there's usually one person who's asking you what kind of sandwich you want and if you want a six inch or a foot long and what kind of meat and cheese and putting that together for you. Um, they'll even toast it for you if you want it toasted. There's usually a second person that's putting your toppings on for you, your veggies, your sauces, whatever. And then there's usually a third person that will be um, that will be there ringing up your order and, and taking your money. And sometimes there's a fourth person working in the back bringing out extra supplies as needed. Usually that's the manager. Um, and, and after that, if you add more workers, um, it really isn't going to help your output increase tremendously. Now, if there's a drive through at the subway, maybe you need an extra worker to work at the drive through But, you know, you can see that once we get up into this range here of five, six, seven workers, it's like they're not helping us anymore. They're not helping us. And the seventh worker actually causes output to decrease because, you know, it's getting too crowded. There's too much going on. Too many cooks in the kitchen. All right. So marginal product... Um, is just another way of looking at the data that we just looked at. Um, marginal product can be derived from total product. So marginal product is the derivative of total product, if you are a calculus person. Uh, marginal product is the change in output from a one unit increase in the input. So it's um, how much more output can be produced when um, we add one more input. So change in output over change in the number of inputs. Um, so I've added a third column here to the data to show you how marginal product is calculated. Um, and marginal product, what it's basically telling us is how many subs each worker added to total output. So the first worker added 20 more subs than when there were zero workers. So the marginal product of the first worker is 20 subs. The second worker, you can see um, total product for two workers is 50, total product for one worker is 20. So the additional number of subs that the second worker added to total output is 30. Okay, The third worker has added an additional 40, because 90 minus 50 is 40. Um, the fourth worker has added an additional 30, etc. Now, the reason we can just do that simple subtraction is that the change in the number of, of um, inputs is by one every time here. So notice in the formula, it's change in output over change in the number of inputs, but much like when we were studying utility, um, oftentimes the units change um, by one at a time. Now, I'll warn you that on your problem set for this unit, there's there's a problem that has the, the numbers change by more than one at a time. So you have to make sure you know this formula and you, you do um, divide the change in output by the change in inputs, which isn't necessarily always going to be one if, if you know if they change by more than one. But um, the additional subs here, you can see that each worker adds follows a little bit of a pattern here. So for a while, each additional worker adds more and more to total output. Okay, the first worker adds more than if there were zero workers. The second worker adds more to total output than the first worker even did. Um, the third worker adds more to total output than the second worker added. So the first worker, the second worker, and the third worker are all helping our total output to increase at an increasing rate. So marginal product is increasing. Now the fourth worker comes and they're still helping total product to increase, right, because it goes from 90 up to 120, but now they're helping total product increase by a smaller amount than the worker, the third worker. So the fourth worker is where we would say um, diminishing marginal product sets in, diminishing marginal returns, which we'll learn about in a minute. But this fourth worker still is helping total product increase, but now by a smaller amount than the worker before before him or her. So fifth worker, same deal. You know, they're still helping total product increase, but just by, not by as much as the worker before um, him or her. And the sixth worker doesn't add anything to total output. The seventh worker causes total output to fall. So um, if you were thinking from the point of view of, you know, the, man, the, the owner, I should say, of Subway trying to decide how many... Um, sandwich artist you're going to have on shift here. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to ever pay the sixth worker anything because he's not helping you produce any more. And you definitely would never let the seventh worker in the door, given this data, because even if they were volunteering their time, 
uh, they're causing total output to fall by 10. So that's, you know, we're, we're blocking that person out. Um, now this fifth worker and this fourth worker, even though they're adding more to total output and it's less than the worker before them, um, that that doesn't really tell us if we're going to hire them or not because we would have to know how much it costs to hire them for the shift and how much we can sell the sandwiches for to figure out if the marginal costs versus marginal benefits um, are worth it for, for hiring them for the shift. So we'll get into that in um, unit six actually, but, but just look at the pattern and understand the pattern here. So we have increasing marginal returns with workers one, two, and three, decreasing marginal returns or diminishing marginal returns with workers four and five and six, um, and worker number seven brings in what we call negative marginal returns because they actually cause total product to fall. So what we just saw is true and the pattern that we just um, observed is always going to happen. So this is known as the law of diminishing marginal returns or sometimes economists say LODAR. Um, as more of a variable resource is added to a fixed resource, so as more sandwich artists are, are added to the shift at Subway, the marginal or additional output from the variable resource will eventually decline. The additional number of sandwiches that each worker adds to total output will eventually fall, as we just saw in the previous slide. So this is a really, really important law to know um, because it's gonna it's gonna help us figure out why a lot of the things um, that we're gonna see happening in terms of cost curves and profit curves, why a lot of those things happen, um, and and it can be explained with this law. So looking at this curve graphically, you'll see that the marginal product curve increases um, until we get to the third worker here. So that's the increasing marginal returns portion. Uh, like we said, the fourth, fifth, and sixth worker are still causing total product to increase, but they're adding less to total output than the worker before them. So this is the diminishing marginal returns portion of the curve. And that seventh worker causes total product to fall. So that um, would be categorized as negative marginal returns. Now remember, marginal product is the derivative of total product. So when we compare these two curves, you'll see that as increasing marginal returns are occurring, so as each input is adding more to total output than the worker before him, total product curve is increasing at an increasing rate. So the slope of this curve is increasing. Um, when we get to the portion where diminishing marginal returns set in here, um, what that means is each of these workers is still causing total product to rise, but they're adding less to total output than the worker before them. So if you line that up vertically here, you'll see total product still rising, but now it's not rising as fast. So it's still increasing, but now at a decreasing rate during the diminishing marginal returns portion of the curve here. and this last uh, worker causes total product to fall. Okay, so we know that that's the negative marginal returns portion of the curve, um, and so that's why total product is gonna be pulled down at that point. Our final calculation and, and term to know here is average product. Average product measures output per unit of input, and um, the way that you calculate it is total product divided by the quantity of inputs. So for example, with our subway data, um, when two workers were working, the total product or to total output or total number of sandwiches produced was 50. So since 50 divided by two is 25, 25 would be our average product or the average amount that each worker is contributing to total output. Um, when three workers were working, the total output was um, 90, I believe. So 90 divided by 3 is 30. So the average output per worker when three workers were on shift would be 30 apiece. Um, average output is um, something you just need to know how to how to calculate. Um, we'll, we'll be using it later, but um, average product doesn't help us figure out how many workers to hire because we're going to use marginal analysis to do that. But um, again, it's just another, another calculation to know and um, we'll be coming back to that later in the course. So that brings us to the end of the slideshow here. Um, again, big things to walk away with today are understanding the pattern that occurs when um, additional variable inputs are added to um, fixed inputs in short run production and um, understanding the law of diminishing marginal returns.